Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday service here at Holy Sepulchre, London. I'm sure we've all had um, different weeks. We all come with different things. We've probably got things ahead of us in the week to come. But let's just take some time now to um, still our hearts and open our minds to what the Lord has to say to us this morning. And uh, before Luke comes to lead us in sung worship, let's just uh, maybe close our eyes. I've got some words here from Psalm 19. And throughout this morning, as particularly when we're singing songs of worship, if you think God is speaking to you, there's got any words for you that aren't just for you, but they're for the building up of the body, please do um, feel free to share them. There'll be a, a chance for you to do so. But for now, let's just close your eyes and maybe just focus on God. And these words from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteousness. They are more precious than gold, than much more pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, worship together. I uh, encourage us to, to sing out wherever we are this morning, or if that uh, isn't quite where you're at this morning, then do just let the words minister over you as we uh, worship together with our songs now. As we begin our time together this morning, you might want to just let some of the things that we're thankful for from the past few days, the past few weeks, just come to the, the, I guess, the front of our heads and our hearts. And we want to lift those to God now and just thank him for his goodness and his greatness. And even in our struggles, God, we thank you that you are there with us, that your presence sustains us. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never Bless the Lord, oh my soul, yeah, oh 
goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Yeah. Oh, bless the I worship to you, Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who was and is and is to come. Yeah. Who the sound of singing lift up his name in all the earth yeah. lift up your voice and give him glory for he is worthy to be
with the sound of singing, oh yes, lift up his name in all the earth, oh, and lift up your voice and give him glory, for he is worthy to With the sound of singing, lift up his name in all the earth, yeah, and lift up your voice and give him glory, for he is worthy to be praised. worthy Jesus is. Oh, you are worthy, Lord. We give you all the honor, all the praise, Jesus is. God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting a battle. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Yeah. Oh, every knee will bow. Yeah. It's coming on the cloud.
every knee will bow before him. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Oh, we surrender all to you, Jesus. We bow the knee before you, Jesus. And every tongue confess that you are the Lord. Jesus, we fix our eyes on you. We choose to follow you, to chase after you, to run with you. To surrender our lives to you. And as Rachel said at the beginning of our, our time together, it might be that as we fix our eyes on Jesus, as we worship him together, he might give us by his spirit a word or a picture. It might be a scripture, something to encourage the church. So if you felt the Lord has given you anything, we're going to take a moment, do unmute and uh, speak that out if, if a couple of people speak at the same time then it's a bit messy that's fine we can work through that or it might be that actually the Lord hasn't given you anything and if that's the case we're just going to take a few moments just to rest to be still in his presence but if he has given you something feel free to unmute now and, um, and Rachel will then hand back to you Jesus Jesus Matthew 6 and when you pray go into your room close the door to your father go close the door and pray to your father who is unseen and in this time when we have been unseen as a congregation for such a long time this uh, this scripture this spoke out to me this morning we have gone into our rooms and prayed to our Father who is unseen. But the time is coming soon when we will be able to emerge. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just want to thank you that although you are unseen, that you are here with us. Lord, we thank you that as we just rest in your presence, that you will minister to us. You know our needs, Lord. And Lord, as we rest, we thank you that you are ministering to those needs. Thank you, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we can be transformed and changed. Lord, we thank you that as we wait on you, your spirit ministers to each of us and brings about that transformation and that change. Thank you, Lord, that you've sung about the captives being set free. Thank you, Lord, that you set us free that we don't need to be bound by those chains, but that we are assured of freedom with you. Mm. And just continuing in prayer, obviously a big event that's happened in this week has been the death of his Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. And the Church of England has put forward some prayers that we might just
pray and remember this morning. And on the screen, there's the words of those prayers. I'm going to say them out loud. You might just want to close your eyes and listen, or if you want to keep yourselves muted and say them out loud at the same time, please do. God of our lives, we give thanks for the life of Prince Philip, for the love he shared among us and for his devotion to duty. We entrust him now to your love and mercy through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Merciful God, be close to all who mourn, especially the Queen and all the members of the royal family. May they know the hope of your promises and the comfort of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May Christ, our Lord, give us peace. Amen. And Lord, as we think of those who are mourning, Lord, we just lift them up to you. Lord, when somebody dies who we might not know personally, it might just remind us of other losses in our lives. So Lord, I pray if anyone this morning is feeling a sense of loss, that they will know your comfort. And Lord, thank you that you said that you are the resurrection and the life and that anyone who believes in you will live, even though they will die. And whoever lives by believing in you will never die. Thank you for that promise that you are the resurrection and the life. And as we think about that and we continue to celebrate your resurrection and the power of your resurrection, and we think back in the last week to Easter Sunday, let us just um, pray the collect for today, the special prayer for today. God of glory, by the raising of your son, you have broken the chains of death and hell. Fill your church with faith and hope, for a new day has dawned, and the way to life stands open in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your death and your resurrection. Thank you that our sins are forgiven and that we might know you personally. And Lord, thank you that as we spend time in your presence this morning, you will speak to us. And if we just draw now together all of these prayers on the screen, there should be the Lord's Prayer. And um, we're, let's all pray it together. It's okay for everyone to unmute. If you want to say it in your own language, please do. Um, but hopefully on the screen, we'll get the words of the Lord's Prayer coming up so that everyone has the right words version together. Brilliant, they're just coming up now. So all together, our Father, what? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 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 Well, for those of you who um, weren't here when we started, I'd just like to say welcome again to this morning's service at Holy Sepulchre. We're delighted that we've got Lou who is going to be um, speaking this morning and um, we're going to uh, have some Bible readings now. And um, for those of you who We've got your own Bibles again. We have got them, the words coming up on the screen, but um, we have a number of um, places this morning where we're going to be looking first of all at Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 to 12, then Exodus chapter 14, 15 to 22, and John chapter 20, 19 to 29. So, first of all, Exodus chapter 14 verses 10 to 12. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Continuing at verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of the Lord, who'd been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so that neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Then moving on to John chapter 20, Jesus appears to his disciples, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I seal the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Ah, I I can unmute myself, that's good. Well, isn't the Anglican lectionary a wonderful thing? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We've been preaching our way uh, through it, and there's even yet another passage which I'm briefly going to read to you because it's relevant to our message, and that comes out of 1 John 1, 8 and 9, which we all know well because we use it pretty much every week. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Official estimates vary, but um, A21, the global anti-trafficking organisation I work with, estimates that something around 40 million people in the world live in physical slavery today. Over 100,000 of them right here in the United Kingdom, right in front of our very eyes in one of the most enlightened countries in the world. And that is just physical slavery. Who knows how many more live in conditions where some kind of mental or emotional slavery cripples their lives. The recent Black Lives Matter movement reminded the world once again, just how pervasive and insidious the past enslavement of peoples can be to their present emotional and mental health. You only have to look at the figures for mental illness amongst Britain's Afro-Caribbean population to see 
something has clearly gone wrong. And the internet is full of information about the ongoing oppression and enslavement of peoples by governments and countries all around the world. Just to name a few, Sudan, Tigray, Syria, Nigeria, Yemen, Myanmar, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, and Israel. Yes, Israel. How tragic is that? The very people that are the subject of release from slavery in our reading today are themselves now considered by most international measures of justice to be the oppressors. Condemning the Palestinians to the same social exclusion, economic oppression, and unfettered theft of their property that one would easily identify with Black Crow or apartheid regimes, an abusive treatment of a people akin to slavery. How far and how easily do we all fall? But whatever the horrors of physical, emotional and mental slavery, our passage in 1 John reminds us that there is a place we can find ourselves in that's even worse. A place where our very souls are enslaved, enslaved to sin. A place of such utter darkness that ultimately, if we choose to live in it long enough, even the love of God will not penetrate it. I'll explain in a minute why I'm taking us all in such, into such a dark and challenging place. But let me first digress. I have the privilege, <coughs> excuse me, of working with some amazing people in the anti-human trafficking world. One of these people, Dr. Rhiannon Bell, who heads up A21's victim aftercare work, is a world expert in restoring the lives of children and women who've been through trafficking, trafficking experiences that are really too traumatic for me to talk about here. Rhiannon has talked to me about the emotional and psychological journey that many trafficked victims go through in their traumatic experience. Obviously, everyone's different, and a trafficked victim's psychological responses to their situation will vary, but there are recognisable patterns. This will often involve initial reactions of fear, anxiety, and resistance to their predicament. Initial reactions to finding oneself enslaved are often exacerbated by the fact that a victim is coerced or tricked into slavery by a breach of trust, a broken promise that was relied upon. Often there then follows denial and guilt at being tricked and anger at the betrayal. But as time goes on, and many victims are enslaved for years, acquiescence can develop involving depression, withdrawal and acceptance of the situation. These are protective mechanisms. And then almost counterintuitively, a victim can begin to exhibit a mental and emotional state of cooperation, dependence, alignment, even the victim defending the trafficker. Ironically, after years of abuse, fear and anxiety of life outside the enslaved condition can build a resistance to freedom. These psychological phases are likely to be far more powerful and destructive in life uh, than anything you and I might experience in our lives. But I raise them because they may have relevance to your experiences over the last year. Lockdown has not been easy for anyone. And it may assist us in our return to normality to be able to understand what we may have suffered, a similar and emotional uh, and psychological trajectory. 
And while not slaves, we have been resistant to our enforced isolation. We have been angry at times, depressed, withdrawn, acquiescent. And we may find ourselves in a place where we are anxious about life outside our isolation. We might even be facing the future with fear. But our passages today teach us that we don't have to live in such places. God has in the past and will today provide a way of escape. Our God is the God who parts the sea, who removes the impenetrable barrier when the enemy has our backs to the wall. Our God is the God who enters the locked room and releases peace, power and freedom. And if you today are looking back at a past year of failure, loneliness, oppression, if you today are standing at the edge of your own Red Sea or in your own locked room and looking to an uncertain future with fear and anxiety, then the God of the Bible has something to say to you and he's ready to act today, just as he did in the past. First, let's remind ourselves of the close parallels between the miraculous opening of the Red Sea by God and the release of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and the death and resurrection of Jesus. The former is a precursor, a forerunner, an earthly demonstration by God in the physical realm of what he would later do through Jesus in the spiritual realm. Jesus' death and resurrection was a heavenly parting of the sea of sin that separates us from God, opening a way for all spiritually enslaved people to escape from that slavery and cross over to the promised land of spiritual freedom and eternal life with God. Now, I know you all know this. What I want to remind us of today is what God actually says and does at these times when we, his people, are seeking to escape the enslavement of the past. And in these passages in the Old Testament, and particularly in the recorded events of Jesus' appearances to the disciples after the resurrection, there's much to learn about this. Unfortunately, today, I don't have my two favourite post-resurrection stories to preach on. The appearance of the disciples to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, which is in Mark and Luke's Gospel, and chapter 21 of John which explains the spiritual significance of the great Aussie barbecue on the beach. So maybe one day, but there's plenty to glean from our passages today. God does not just open the prison door and leave us to our own devices. He wants to speak into and act in our situation. Okay. The first thing God does for those escaping from slavery is in Exodus 14, verse 19. And God does this to reveal his glory and so that the enemy who has enslaved us knows just who they're now dealing with. Verse 19 says, Then the angel of God, who had been travelling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. So why does God stand behind us? Well, look at what is chasing the Israelites. Pharaoh and his army are coming after them. It is the Israelites past and it is coming after them to reclaim them. But God is having none of it. 
He's cut them off from their past and he's now going to deal with it. And so it is with us. When we seek to escape from slavery of the past, God goes and stands behind us to help us deal with it. If you read on in Exodus, you'll see that God threw the pursuing enemy into confusion. The wheels came off their chariots and they were thrown into disarray. That is exactly what he does to your pursuing sin. A couple of days ago, Amanda said to me, no one ever preaches on pornography. Why is that? Well, here goes. When I was a teenager in the 1960s and a long way from God, what you would call soft pornography was everywhere in my life. All my mates from school had stacks of Playboy and Penthouse magazines in their bedrooms or rumpus rooms where we would hang out after school and on weekends. To be honest, we never really thought there was a problem with it. it just seemed normal. But a few weeks after I had made a decision to follow Jesus in Alaska, I travelled back to Vancouver in Canada to try and work out what I was going to do with my life. I was staying at an acquaintance house and as I reached over to the coffee table where there was a stack of girly magazines, I heard a voice. Clear as day, it asked, can you take that where you are going, Lou? I immediately realised that there were things in my old life that would not be part of my future walk with Jesus. Now, Amanda prays every day that I will hear that voice again about fast cars and motorbikes. But there he was. God had stationed himself behind my new life. He was now rear gunner on my desire to follow Jesus. And the wheels were going to fall off on sin's desire to catch me and drag me back into slavery. You know, that is what he will do for you in the weeks ahead as we emerge from lockdown. Trust him. God has got your back. The second thing God does is in verse 20. Throughout the night, the cloud, which was between the armies of Israel and Pharaoh, brought darkness to the armies of Pharaoh and light to the armies of Israel. So neither side went near the other all night long. When you seek to escape from slavery, not only does God station himself as protection for you against your past, he casts your enemies into darkness and he shines a light forward from behind you so that you can see where you're going. Years ago, I remember leading a group of people at night on a walk and we only had one torch. I started by walking in front of the group, but soon people were getting left behind, losing the path, tripping over things. Eventually went to the back of the group and shone the light forward on the path and all of us could see much better. This is what God does spiritually. He shines his light from the best perspective for us to see what we need to see. The third thing to note is what God says in verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you still crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch it out. Stretch your hand out over the sea. When we are facing apparently insuperable obstacles to the future, when we just can't find the strength to face what's in front of us, here is God's exhortation. 
by all means cry out to me, but don't stop there. Move on. Take that first faltering step. You will not get to the promised land by sitting down and giving up. A step taken in faith is a mighty powerful thing. Verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. What did it take for God to open the way to freedom and release for the people of Israel? It only took a small step of faith and the use of only what Moses already had in his hand. And isn't that what God is asking of us today? To find release from this last year, we need simply take a small step of faith and move on from where we are. And all that we need to do will be at hand. Nothing more. Trust him. So that's something of God the Father at work to release us from slavery. Now let's turn to our New Testament reading and see what Jesus might say and do. The first thing I want you to notice in John 20 is verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. And again, verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. So pervasive can our fears be that even after Jesus had physically revealed his resurrected, death-conquering self to the disciples, and not even after he had breathed the Holy Spirit into their lives, they were still so fearful that they needed to lock the doors. Fear can be a paralyzing force. It can make us withdrawn and impotent. A locked room may be a safe place, but it is also a self-made prison. But look at the rest of those verses. Jesus comes. Jesus comes. Notwithstanding the locked door, notwithstanding the prison that the disciples had built around themselves, Jesus was having none of it. And so it is with us. If during lockdown we've withdrawn into what looks like a safe haven, but is in reality a prison, Fear not. Jesus will come to you. The Bible is full of stories of Jesus coming to individuals in their hour of need, wherever they are, whatever their circumstances. How much more will he come to you, you who have not seen him, but yet believe? He calls you blessed. And from verse 9, we also learn that not only will he come to you, he will stand right in the middle of your situation. He is not going to be hiding over there in the corner. No, he will stand in the heart of your struggle, anxiety and fear. And then, then begins the amazing bit. He will do two things. First, he will speak peace into your situation. You know, not that peace that comes from sticking a couple of earplugs in. No, the peace that passes all understanding. The peace that you don't expect. The peace that by all earthly measures has no right to be there. But that's the point. This is no earthly peace. It is the peace of the presence of God revealed on earth. That's the first thing he will do as he stands in the middle of your situation. 
The second thing he will do is reveal his reality to you. That is what he did when he came to the disciples in their locked room. That's why he showed the disciples his scars. They say, you see this attempt at killing off God? Well, it failed. And if you think that your fear, even the fear of death, can kill off God's purposes in your life, then you're mistaken. My reality is greater, says Jesus. My reality is more powerful, more life-changing, more death-conquering, more resurrecting than any other reality. My reality in your situation is all you need. Trust me. And if you think that's not mind-blowing enough, the next thing Jesus does in verse 22 is release power right into the middle of your locked room. The power of the Holy Spirit. How much power is that? Well, in verse 23, Jesus just happens to mention that it's enough to forgive sins. What? Only God can do that. Is Jesus saying that we, us puny people, can exercise godly power? Well, yes, he is. As Paul says in Ephesians, he who is standing there in the middle of your isolation, in the middle of your locked room of anxiety and fear, is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power. I get so frustrated with the church sometimes. It so often acts like the person who owns a Formula One Mercedes, but uses it to poodle down to the saver center to get the groceries. What could we achieve for God if we took hold of the power and authority he has given us as his people. Imagine, says Jesus. Ask, says Jesus. Trust him. And finally, let's turn to Thomas. I love Thomas. He's so often criticised for his reaction to the disciples' report of having seen Jesus alive. And yes, Blessed are those that have not seen him in the flesh and yet still believe. But we forget that Thomas only asked for exactly the same signs that Jesus had already shown the disciples. The scars of his crucifixion. The signs that proved this person really was Jesus. The sign of Jesus' own reality. The point here for us is doubt. We all have doubts about what we are capable of. And even like Thomas, what God is capable of. To me, the point of Thomas's story is that God is not afraid of our doubt. God does not duck around our doubts, misgivings, uncertainties, even our lack of faith. He deals with them head on. You have doubts. I have doubts. That's fine. Ask God and he'll help us all through them. There's nothing in God that he needs to hide or apologize for. Put any doubts you have about the future before God, just like Thomas did. Trust him. He'll help us all through them. There's so much more, but let me finish where I started. If you are looking back at the last year and seeing a past of failure, frustration, loneliness, depression, if you're looking at standing at the edge of your own Red Sea or in your own locked room, 
and looking to an uncertain future with fear and anxiety, then the God of the Bible has something to say and he's ready to act in your life today. Imagine, ask, trust him. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Luke to give us a moment of space with some music and draw us into some worship. Maybe, hopefully, the Lord has encouraged you today. And we don't know what the future is going to hold, <laughs> but he'll be with us. It is going to be okay. Amen. Amen. Why don't we uh, do just as Lou has suggested and take a few moments just to be still before God, to reflect on what we've just heard. And Holy Spirit, we pray that in these next few moments, you might bring to the forefront of our minds those things that you want us to wrestle with now. Maybe Lou's words have stirred thoughts or feelings in our heads and our hearts and Holy Spirit we we wrestle with those with you now Spirit would you minister to our hearts Jesus would we know you with us we hear the truth of all that you say about us and over us. Help us to imagine, help us to see all that you have for us and all that you would have us be. We trust you, Jesus. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of the sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling yeah. bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born and Jesus is calling Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with the prayer. 
precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus. to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. Yeah, I am. God, this very day, would we hear you speaking the truth of who you are over us and the truth of who we are in you. Would we know what it means to belong to you, knowing that Jesus has paid the price for us, that he's opened the way to the Father, that we are free that we are free, 
And Jesus, we walk in your freedom, knowing that you walk with us, knowing that you go before us and behind us. And Jesus, use us for your kingdom, we pray. And that every day in the ordinary, in the big moments and the small moments, God, would we hear your spirit prompting us as we partner with you in the building of your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. As we see your kingdom rule and reign extended into all the earth, we walk with you, Jesus. We follow you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Luke. And thank you, Lou. I was um, really struck at the beginning that Lou said, um, if we say we've got no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. And then as we're forgiven from sin, God releases his peace, his power and his freedom. So whatever is before you this week, just remember that. And remember that Jesus will come to you wherever you are and whatever your circumstances, bringing your, his peace and speaking and revealing his reality to you. And that's not just for Lou or for Luke or me, that's for all of us. So that's something that we can think of as we go ahead in the week ahead of us. Talking of the week ahead of us, before we have our final prayer of blessing, um, we have got some notices and there should be a, a slide coming up uh, with the notices. Um, just to remind you, we have our usual Tuesday lunchtime service and also um, our newly um, re-established uh, choral service on Wednesday now. Um, it's because we're doing everything virtually, it will be online from six o'clock, but you can access both the Tuesday and the Wednesday services through um, the church website. Um, then just going back to the notices slide, um, something that's starting that's brand new tomorrow night, it's called Something Better. It's in the sort of what I call the tea time slot um, between 5.30 and 6.30. Uh, we're co-hosting this with CBRE, who did an alpha group last term, and it's entitled Something Better, and it will run for four Mondays, but over five weeks because of the bank holiday, uh, looking at four different aspects of how Jesus is our hero and how that's demonstrated in Mark's gospel. So if you want more information about that, please go to courses at hsl.church. And then advance notice, and this is really exciting, something for everyone's diaries. Um, we are going to be running something called the wellness journey. It's um, looking about our well-being um, in the Christian context. And we're going to do mirror sessions, one in the tea time slot on a Monday, time to be confirmed. And then we'll do a, another one on Thursday lunchtime in the hope that everyone will be able to free up one or other of those times. More details to follow, but it will be starting either on the 17th of May, if you're going for the Monday or the 20th of May, if it's the Thursday. So mark out those times in your diary now. And finally, uh, earlier we prayed um, the Church of England prayers following the death of Prince Philip. Um, Nick has asked me to mention that the Church of England on its website has an online book of condolence. And uh, if you want to um, write a condolence, um, there's an opportunity to do that if you look at churchofengland.org. Uh, before we um, just bring our service to a close, I should say that if Lou has said anything um, that's really spoken to you this morning, but actually you'd like to have the opportunity to privately pray with some members of our ministry team, please just drop me a message now in chat. We've got some people, I'm on Holy Sepulchre London, we've got some people who are ready and would be delighted to pray with you because sometimes when we have to give up things, it helps when we have others to um, stand by us and where we're going through situations to have others stand uh, by us in prayer. Um, and as always, once the service has finished, we uh, please do um, stay around. We will have some time to catch up with each other's in, in smaller groups um, and uh, joining one of our breakout rooms.
but let's just finish with um, some prayer of blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us and make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore, now and evermore. Amen.